So, um, <clears throat> we're about in the middle of René Guénon's uh, reign of quantity and the, sign of the, t the signs of the times. And I read the, these middle uh, five chapters here, which are on um, chapter 14, Mechanism and Materialism, 15, The Illusion of Ordinary Life, 16, The Degeneration of Coinage, uh, 17, The Solidification of the World, and then 18, Scientific Mythology and Popularization. Um, I'm a little disappointed with the book in the sense that I thought there would be more discussion of uh, Ganon, after all, is a, uh, an esoterist um, who are well known for their facility with the handling of symbols. And there really is no discussion of symbols or symbolism in the book, just a, a series of complaints. Um, and I think the book is a, kind of a disappointment in the sense that as you read through it, these chapters are just complaints. He's just complaining and complaining and complaining. He's not going into uh, much of the metaphysics of all this, and he certainly doesn't go into uh, any discussions, any extended discussions, which I had hoped that he would do, into symbolism. So I want to have a little fun in this video with the symbolism on the back of the dollar bill. Uh, I want to walk through the gateway that he opens in the chapter called The Degeneration of Coinage. Um, but before we get to that, <clears throat> the thing about it is we can't be in a Kali Yuga in the sense that uh, the Hindus say that the whole world entered a Kali Yuga in 3102 BC. Um, that's nonsense, of course, because that just rides roughshod over the entire history of civilization. I mean, in 3102 BC, civilization was just getting going with the Sumerians and the city-state of Uruk. Uh, they were inventing writing and then all these singularities, innovations, all this kind of stuff was just getting going. And if we say that the entirety of human history since 3102 BC has been a Kali Yuga, well, that just doesn't work at all because we miss the beauty of the efflorescence of each one of these civilizations coming into being with an early phase, flourishing with a magnificent phase of art, literature, culture, beauty, and then declining into torpor with uh, Caesarism and universal states and authoritarianism. It's the same process over and over again, which Spengler identified, and I think Spengler's model is a much better model for this than Ganon. He, he really fails to provide, I think, a good model here. He just sets up a difference engine between uh, quality, the realm of spirituality, and quantity, the, the reign of materialism. And um, that's just very binary, binary and just kind of, it, it's lacking a lot of finesse. There, Ganon is a bit of a disappointment, I must say. Um, so... You know, it was the German scholar in 1764, Winkelmann, who published uh, The History of the Art of Antiquity, in which he was the first to introduce into aesthetics, into the domain of art, this idea that every art that comes along goes through an art cycle of necessity, beauty, and then superfluity. So necessity is what brings it into being in the first place. I guess we have a series of like Heideggerian Aragnus events and then there's a, a, a floraison when the flower is produced and we get beauty. Uh, let's say Greek sculpture of the 5th century BC in, in Athens. That's as good as sculpture has ever gotten or will ever get. Uh, floraison. And then we get a decline into superfluity, let's say, Greek sculpture during the Hellenistic period, which is largely worthless. I mean, it's, you know, just, it's bizarre and silly, trivial, trite, and it's lost contact with what Ganon would call the realm of quality, which is the realm of qualitative spiritual essences. Um, there's a distinction that Spangler makes in the decline of the West between what he calls culture and civilization. And culture, uh, each one of these civilizations goes through this process of necessity, beauty, and superfluity uh, that Winkelmann identified and that Goethe picked up from him. The Germans were really good at figuring out these art cycles um, each one of these civilizations has gone through this, and each one has gone through a period of culture, culture, in which the values of the civilization are essentially metaphysical. At first, they're just strictly religious. Then they become uh, a bit secularized, and there's a shift from a uh, religious attitude of piety as the city is coming in. Uh, the city exerts effects, its own bias, towards secularism that comes in and you get metaphysics with philosophy uh, in our own Northwestern Faustian civilization. This is the period of Descartes and the period of uh, moving out of the, the dark 
medieval crypts that Descartes was trying to rid us of with the light of reason coming in and shining a light, illuminating all of this, shifting into a purely metaphysical mode that, that inaugurates the wonderful epoch, epoch in philosophy of Descartes and uh, Leibniz and Spinoza and all those guys. Uh, so we get that, this, this sort of middle period, the great metaphysical period. And then there's always a decline. We get the late period, which is the Floreazon and the Greeks with Plato and Aristotle. And in our own case, as Spengler identified with the German idealists. No better philosophers have ever been produced in Western civilization than Kant, Fichte, Goethe, Schelling, and Hegel. That was the great final efflorescence in the autumn period that ended the culture phase. Then after them, you get the shift, starting with Schopenhauer. Uh, poor guy, he becomes a kind of whipping boy for, for Spengler, uh, who introduces materialism. He gets, he's the first philosopher to get rid of God. Schopenhauer comes on stage, and he's the first to say, we don't need God. We've got the will. The will is the cosmic thing that's brought everything into being. It drives not only the sex drive and the will to exist, it brings gravity into being and electromagnetism. Everything is the will striving against itself and it's struggle and strife everywhere. People love this because it was consistent with Darwin. Uh, 1859, The Origin of Species, that came out and then suddenly everyone was interested in Schopenhauer because he provided this sort of weird mixture of materialism and idealism uh, that everybody loved, and he became famous for the last decade of his life, but for Spangler, he signifies the shift into the civilization period, which is his Kali Yuga, in which the values now become materialistic, and we start shifting into an age now uh, in which everything becomes quantized. Ganon is right here about this. Quantity, the reign of quantity comes in, and we start getting a shift into materialistic philosophies, Positivism comes in, materialism, atomism in the sciences. Everything becomes reduced to what Ganon calls ordinary life in these chapters. Uh, ordinary life. And ordinary life is simply the life of reality in which the average person lives. And that life as reality is that which is apparent to the senses. The super sensible world is simply shorn away. It just gets sheared away in these late phase epochs in these civilizations and regarded as something unnecessary. What's necessary is the struggle for survival in the material realm and nothing is real that isn't atomistic. Everything is strictly materialistic in these late phases. So we get a decline into civilization and then eventually a decline into the rise and building of what Toynbee called a universal state in which empire comes along um, and everything, democracy declines into autocracy, and we get a ruler, an authoritarian ruler who comes along, as in the New Kingdom in Egypt, uh, in which we get a cosmopolitan world ecumeny that is unified by a dictator, and uh, then we get the universal empire, as the Egyptians created uh, after they expelled the Hyksos, and they went into Palestine, and they conquered the whole deal, all the way up to uh, the Hittites, who stopped them. Um, and the same thing with uh, the Romans, creating the Pax Romanica under Augustus Caesar, with Virgil as his official poet, um, shifting, basically making a mockery of the Republican ideals that were anti-monarchical, uh, that the whole Roman constitution was built out of, and that the Americans, as we'll see in a moment, m uh, drew inspiration from for the founding of their, their universal colonies, the, the 13 colonies is a new uh, order. Um, so before we get into that, now Ganon has this idea which he calls solidification. So solidification in these chapters he's talking about, uh, in the Kali Yuga of these civilizations there's the solidification process that goes on in which uh, not only do you have the reign of quantity but you also have this translation of everything spiritual into physical, mundane, material reality. Um, the Hindus made a very useful distinction here that I think can be plugged into uh, Ganon's distinction between quality and quantity, which is two different types of matter, sukshma and stula. Sukshma matter is self-luminous. Sukshma is the realm of myth and dream, and the forms in myth and dream are self-luminous. They're like bioluminescent fish at the bottom of the sea that surface up to us. Uh, they appear in myth and dreams. That's the realm of, of what Ganon would call quality, the realm of spiritual essences. And then there's the realm of stula forms, which are the forms of the physical 
body, gross matter. Uh, what you wake up from as you come out of the dream, you wake up into waking consciousness, uh, which is always a bit of a disappointment by contrast with the dreaming world, and you come out into this world of stula forms, which are made out of gross matter subject to the law of causality. Everything is cause and effect. It's a little bit boring by contrast with the realm, metaphysical realm of, of, of sukshma forms, of self-luminous forms. So what I think Ganan is, is seeing here as happening is that the West has entered, uh, at the time that he's writing this book in the 1940s, is it, uh, that a process of solidification has come in in which the sukshma forms, the realms of the spiritual principles, are being translated into stula forms, into the realm of gross matter, Phys pure, mundane, boring physicality in which the forms are gradually losing touch with the founding iconotypes that set the whole civilization in motion to begin with. Um, okay, so he's got this chapter called The Degeneration of Coinage in the middle of these five chapters. And in that chapter, he has this idea that uh, if you look back over the history of coinage, what you see is that uh, coinage is always associated with spiritual symbols. If you look on these Hellenistic coins, or if you look on the coins that were produced by the Celts, uh, there are all these little uh, esoteric symbols that in indicate, according to Ganon, the interference of spiritual authority into the realm of monetary finance. So it's always, spiritual authority has always had something to do with the realm of finance, uh, as evidenced by esoteric symbolism on coins and coinage uh, throughout history. And I think he's got a good point here. And he says that in modernity, this is being lost. We're losing touch with these symbols. And so at this point, I think it'd be fun to take a look at the symbolism on the back of the dollar bill, uh, <clears throat> where we have uh, the Great Seal of the United States, uh, which was put on here by Roosevelt, so FDR in 1935, authorized the Great Seal to be put on here for the first time. And the Great Seal consists of the pyramid here and the eagle here. Uh, the Great Seal was designed by the Founding Fathers, and they specifically hired a guy named Charles Thompson, who designed it in, and it became official in 1782. Um, by, uh, and it was involved with, uh, Thompson was in communication, he was a merchant who was in communication with uh, Jefferson Franklin and John Adams. Uh, Franklin rather depressingly wanted to have the turkey on here instead of the uh, the eagle as the American bird, which would have been a huge mistake. <laughs> he said the symbolism sailed over Franklin's head. Franklin was a pragmatist; he wasn't that good with this kind of metaphysical stuff. Um, so these the Great Seal does not appear on the back of the dollar bill until FDR authorizes it in 1935, but it's designed in 1782 um, in full connection at that time because these guys were all Masons. So they were in full connection with the spiritual tradition. So let's take a look at what the, what the symbols say here. Um, so what we have is the eagle here. The eagle becomes uh, the official American bird, and that evokes the eagle of Zeus. Zeus was assigned to the eagle. Those are the spiritual powers that have to do with the heavens, the sky, the blue. Um, and Zeus uh, is the great lord of Olympus who has thrust all the titans down into the underworld. And the titans very often have serpent associations, like the god Typhon, who is the half man from the waist up and then has serpents from the waist down. Zeus overthrows him and throws him down into the underworld. So there's an invocation here indirectly of Zeus and the overthrow of the titans. Um, the rise of the 13 colonies represents something new. <laughs> which is why we have the constellation here. Uh, where is it? Uh, the constellation above the eagle uh, is actually meant to represent the birth of a new constellation, and it's built out of a Star of David. I don't think it's a Jewish reference, but it, it is built out of a Star of David. Thirteen stars are there, which represent, of course, the 13 states, uh, but they form uh, two intersecting Pythagorean tetactries, and a tetactris is the Pythagorean triangle, that is built up out of uh, 10 elements, 10 numbers that are put together that symbolize Apollo in the center surrounded by the nine muses. So uh, there are 10 there together. So you have this tetractus. So you have Apollo in the center with the nine muses. And here there's one going up and one going down. Those are the spiritual energies of the earth pushing up against the entropy 
and inertia that, ma that the material world exerts against uh, the spiritual process going down. So we've got the Star of David as a new constellation that is coming to being with these 13 colonies that are founding something new, an Aragnus event. This is in 1776 now. This is an Aragnus event. Um, and <clears throat> the eagle has in one of its talons an olive branch, which symbolizes peace, uh, that has... It looks like it has 13, uh, yeah, it's got the 13 leaves on it for the colonies. There's also a buried reference in there to Christ and his 12 disciples. Christ is the 13th. And uh, 13 arrows. And notice that the eagle's head is turned, um, in this version, the eagle's head is turned toward the olive branch, indicating that America intends peace. But we've got these missiles over here that if you fuck with us, you're going to regret it. You don't want these missiles of Zeus raining down on your cities. You're going to regret fucking with us, so don't think about it. And it's interesting because uh, in 1801, uh, this, there, there was an American silver dollar that was produced with this eagle on there, and the head was turned toward the arrows. Uh, on The, the right-hand talon was clutching the arrows, and journalists made a big fuss about this, indicating that this looks like America is a very aggressive, belligerent country, which of course it is. Uh, but let's, you know we can't have it that way, so they shifted it. Uh, they put the, the arrows in the other hand and the olive branch in the direction of the right that the eagle is looking at. Okay, so then we have the pyramid. And the Masons were very interested, and in, they romanticized Egypt the same way the Greeks did, as the fount of civilization. Everything great comes out of Egypt. So we've got the pyramid with the eye of God on top of it. And a quote from Virgil, Anuit Cheptus, may he smile on our undertakings. That's the invocation of God, uh, who will smile on our undertakings. Under this Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages, we're introducing something new here. The 13 colonies, 13 original states that are all united by this symbolism to create a, new, a singularity, an Aragnus event. Something new is going to happen here. So we've got the pyramid, and it's unfinished. Uh, because they knew that America was unfinished, more stuff was going to happen. And they've got the Eye of God at the top. It has 13 levels, of course. And inscribed on the base of it is uh, Roman numerals for 1776. And if you add those up, of course, 1776, you get 21. 21 is the age of maturity. So we've got rationalism coming in, uh, creating a new order uh, under the power of God that will use reason to, to guide us with a constitution uh, that isn't going to be a, a monarchy. We're not going to have a king or a dictator guiding this. Um, and the quotations from Virgil indicate, Virgil was writing for Augustus. There's a certain irony here. But Virgil was writing for Augustus, and Augustus was, of course, the first great emperor, the dictator, who shredded the, the fact of Augustus and the building of the empire under him with the Pax Romanica was represented by Virgil in the Aeneid as a golden age, as a restarting of the cosmic cycle that had declined as Hesiod presented it from gold uh, to silver to bronze to iron. And now the gold was coming back in as far as Virgil was concerned. He may have been a bit of a sycophant here of, of Augustus. But nonetheless, um, he represented it as a golden age, the building of this empire, which nonetheless, however, made a mockery of the Roman constitution and just shredded it because uh, America defined itself. The references to the Romans are delivered here because America defined itself and built this, wrote this constitution based on Polybius's description of the Roman constitution as being fundamentally anti-monarchical uh, based on checks and balances in which you had two governors, not kings, but consuls who could check each other's powers. And then so gradually over the history of Roman history, uh, they wipe each other out, and then you get one emerging out of that, and it becomes Augustus, the emperor, which is exactly what America doesn't want, but which Spengler saw perhaps uh, as what would happen, because in Spengler's model, uh, we are right now where he predicted we would be at about the time of Augustus. Uh, so we're waiting for that Caesar to appear who will make a mockery of the Roman constitution. Uh, there's a lot of irony built into this. But here's the thing. Now, so we have the pyramid, and the pyramid is, of course, the symbol of the earth power. Um, the pyramid represented in Egypt the appearance of the first mound after the Nile floods 
and begins to recede. The first mound represents the birth of the greening process that will green the black land along the Nile, which represents the power of Osiris. And of course, the eye of God at the top of the pyramid is an you could do an archaeology on that image that goes back through Yaka Burma, of course, and back to the Eye of Horus. And the Eye of Horus was what was used to resurrect his father, Osiris. Once that eye was retrieved, it represents the sun. And once the eye is retrieved, and it's he shines it on the dead body of his father, Osiris, and Osiris awakens. But then he goes down into the underworld, and in that awakening, he becomes the power of the earth to generate plants. Osiris is the god of vegetation, and his power in the earth is what brings the plants forth up out of the earth after he inseminates the land uh, with the flooding of the Nile, which was symbolic of him inseminating Isis. Uh, his constellation rose uh, in the midsummer, and it signaled Orion, uh, which was known as the giant and was Osiris, and behind him comes his consort Sirius, which was Isis, and his insemination of her uh, represented the waters flooding now, inseminating the land and bringing forth rebirth. So we've got this image in front of the pyramid. If you look at it, uh, there's, there's plants growing in front of that pyramid. So Osiris is indirectly invoked here. We've got plants coming out of it. Behind it, there's a wasteland. Um, but the new founding fathers are representing something new that will green the wasteland and bring something new to the world, a republic that's argued into being in writing for the first time in history the birth of a state that's brought into being by literacy, a, a, a constitution, a declaration uh, of independence, and so forth. So all of that's built in there. And uh, But what's interesting, I think, is the this process of solidification that Rene Ganon talks about, uh, in which, during the Kali Yuga, sukshma ideas are translated into gross matter into the realm of stula. For instance, uh, it's interesting if you note that uh, when FDR was first proposed with putting the Great Seal on here, the images were in the opposite order. Reading from left to right, then the, the eagle would have been first, then the pyramid. So the eagle represents the powers of the heavens, and the pyramid the powers of the earth. And in the early version, it, the energies would have been coming down from heaven, reading from left to right, as in the west, would have been coming down from the, earth, uh, the heavens down to the earth. But Roosevelt changed that so that we have the earth first, then the heavens. So we have this movement of spiritual powers that are moving from left to right, from earth to the heavens, which then is exactly what happened with the space age. A few decades later, the god Apollo is invoked with the Apollo missions to the moon. The eagle lands on the moon, and we get this translation of uh, movement of spiritual energy that's already prefigured on the back of the dollar bill here from the realm of the earth to the realm of the heavens. Uh, with Apollo being invoked. I think we also have a translation with the eye of God now uh, to the panopticon, the all-seeing electronic eye that is everywhere you go now. You walk into a Walmart and there's the eye of God looking at you in mechanized form everywhere you go. So there's an interesting translation there, not only of the myth of Apollo in the nine muses but in connection with the space age, but also to the eye of God becoming electronified as this all-seeing eye now, which is indeed everywhere you go. In America, anyway, it's, it's everywhere. You're always on camera. It's like the Truman Show. You're always on camera everywhere you go. And, um, of course, with electronic culture, we're electronifying the Hindu myth of the avatars. Uh, that myth is being electronified. There's a Garuda Airlines, I hear, by the way, somewhere in Asia. Uh, the, the great uh, solar bird of the Hindus is identified with flight. And indeed, in 1935, when Roosevelt okayed this, um, all the great American aviators were, were Howard Hughes was flying uh, record flights with airplanes, which were now mechanizing uh, the Zeus bird of the eagle of myth of subtle matter into the solidification process of appearance on the material plane as the airplane in the 1930s, when all the great aviators were setting world records with Howard Hughes and all the others that were associated with him that were mechanizing and solidifying and translating the realm of subtle matter into the realm of stuba, of gross fact. So, uh, in conclusion, then, uh, it does seem that Ganon was on to something. He was right about this process of solidification that in the Kali Yuga, at the end phase of our civilization here, uh, which is shifting into a from a culture mode, a la Spengler, to a civilization mode, we are 
translating myth into fact, as Joseph Campbell used to say, we're translating myth into fact. The realm of the forms of sukshma, of subtle matter, are being solidified into material actuality as we go along here. So.